All right, guys, welcome back to Title Gardens. I'm here again with Brandy, and we are going to do another little bit of literature review called Reef Receipts. So we're checking in on the receipts because there is like this disconnect between the scientific community and what has been published and the hobbyist community, and sometimes a lot of the curiosities that we have have already been addressed in publication, and if you're like me, I don't like to read scientific journals. <laughs> I kind of got enough of that in undergrad and whatnot. So Brandy actually loves this stuff. And so what are we talking about today? All right. So this one is super applicable to us. It's a 2020 article on the biological controls to manage acropora eating flatworms and coral aquaculture. Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of amazingly on point, isn't it? <laughs> So everybody's got like everybody's got their favorite pet nemesis pest, right? Everybody's got one. Like um, I know that like whenever I talk, why should I? I probably shouldn't like out everybody else's laundry, right? I probably should. I probably, I probably shouldn't out anybody else's laundry. But I know like some coral farms are like Montipora eating nudibranchs are the devil. Uh, another one is like these like spiders. Because they are the devil. Yeah, to some degree, oh, they're all devils, right? But they're not my devil. So my devil happens to be the, the acro-eating flatworm. Most everything else is something I can deal with or I have dealt with or I'm very comfortable ignoring. <laughs> uh, yeah, seriously, there, there's, there's coral farms out there that obsess about pests that I'm like, Definitely don't care about that. Just super don't care. Like Aptasia. Uh, no, I mean, well, Aptasia is like actually super easy to take care of. It's like you get one fish and you don't have an Aptasia problem, right? There's no like, like silver bullet to some of these like top tier pests. That, and also like Aptasia, they don't actively eat coral, right? They might grow and sting and be like a pain in the butt. And so that's not great but they're not like an obligate corallivore, right? That, that, that's where you run into like a real problem where if you have Aptasia, you're not going to be like, oh, I can no longer keep acros in my system, right? So, so this publication is all about a, like natural methods to control it. By the way, I didn't actually read any of these in advance. So <laughs> a lot of this is kind of like an initial reaction to these publications. So by all means, please... Let's dive right in. What do you got? So this is another article that's open access, so that means anybody can go read it. So if you don't like what we're saying, you can go and read and see what these researchers found themselves. Um, and we will provide a link to the article in the description. This is specifically looking at aquaculture, right? Very applicable to us. They're looking at Acropora specifically because Acropora is actually the most abundantly imported coral in most countries. Do you know that? Not surprising just because of how much of it is out there. It's one of those species that's super important to make sure that if there are any pests or diseases that we have an idea of how to control it. One of the things that these researchers said was that this is the very first paper, again written in 2020, that looked at any type of empirical evidence, so like an actual study, to figure out what the effective treatments are for acro eating flatworms. So this is three years old. My first reaction to that was like, I'm surprised the hobbyist community hadn't already hit on some of the conclusions they have here. Well, a lot of the, the hobbyist stuff is is anecdotal, right? So, you know, we, we hear that, okay, certain wrasses, certain damsels and stuff like that control these and certain shrimp control these. But it's never really been like a data-driven scientific method, anything. It's kind of, it is very anecdotal where it's like, I added this and I no longer have this issue. Therefore, I'm happy. Take it for what it's worth. And you know, it's, it's interesting because the authors actually made the point that this, like the whole reason why they did this study is because they were hearing those kind of anecdotes. So they're out trying to replant the Acropora for reef restoration. And so some of these flatworms were problems for what they were trying to replant. And like, so they were hearing some, some of these stories from, I'm assuming hobbyists, they didn't say that specifically. They decided, well, let's go and actually study this and figure out if it 
if any of these organisms, these wrasses or shrimp make any difference. Okay. I actually thought the experimental design for this was pretty good. I think as far as our use, there's some things that they would need to add on. Okay, so before we get into that, so what things do they look at as far as biological control? So they looked specifically at six line wrasses and peppermint shrimp. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which are two things that I have heard quite a bit. It's like some kind of wrasse and some kind of shrimp. There's no other predators in the um, tanks for the acro eating flatworms, but these two things. And they're independent, right? Like only six line wrasses in tanks and then only peppermint shrimp in tanks. Okay. Just as far as the conditions are concerned, I feel like they're, they needed to add a couple more levels just to make it mimic what's going on in aquaculture better. Both of these organisms, so they had nine wrasses and 20 shrimp. What size tanks are we talking about? Do you remember? 3.5 liters for the shrimp and th 13 gallons for the wrasses. Okay, so like really small test containers. Yes. Okay. So they had kept both, both sets of these organisms in tanks for a month. So that way they made sure there was no disease, they were well fed. Because sometimes we see that, right? Like we get in a shrimp, and the shrimp is starving because it hasn't ate in an LFS and in transit and whatever for a large period of time, and then it like mm -hmm. devours everything. Okay. So they wanted to make sure that these organisms actually were being fed, were healthy, there was nothing wrong with them. They fed them twice daily, so shouldn't have been starving. And then they had 96 millipora frags. Acropora millipora. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what they did is they took the millipora, acropora, and put three flatworms on each one of the frags and let those flatworms like do what they were going to do. How sad is that? Could you imagine like intentionally putting acro eating flatworms on a hundred frags? <laughs> yeah, I don't love it. <laughs> um, so they took the and they put three flatworms on each one of the frags and waited for the flatworms to lay eggs. They made sure that there were eggs on each one of the frags. After a few days, I don't think they actually said how long they let the flatworms hang out on the Acropora, but after whatever time period they decided on, they counted how many flatworms were on there, so how many had reproduced, and also how many eggs using a microscope. For the shrimp and the wrasses, what they did was they took and put that Acropora in a one gallon tank for shrimp, and a 13 gallon shrimp um, tank for wrasses, and basically counted how many of the eggs in the Acro eating flatworms, the shrimp and wrasses ate. Okay. So a pretty straightforward experiment, right? What they found was that the wrasses ate all the flatworms. Hmm. So in a 13 gallon tank where all there is is an acro plug, in 24 hours, a wrasse will eat all the flatworms across all their trials. That's what they found. Okay, so six lines. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Six line wrasses. Shrimp ate most of the flatworms. They ate 80% of the flatworms across all the trials. Wrasses, however, didn't eat any of the eggs. Mm -hmm. So wrasses ate all the flatworms but didn't touch a single flatworm egg. The shrimp ate about 60% of the eggs. In a certain period of time. 24 hours. So just in 24 hours. 60% yeah. in 24 hours. It's not bad. But there's also, the only thing in this tank is this one frag plug. Yeah. A lot, a lot of questions about, uh, about the experiment there. So the first thing that, that pops, popped into my head is that there's a lot of shrimp out there that commonly get called a peppermint shrimp. Mm -hmm. There's like a dozen of them that looks like, it's, it's like a a lineup, right? And you're like, well, which one's the peppermint? So this is the specific species they looked at, at Lasmata vitata. Is that how you say that? Could be. So the, the species name is spelled V-I-T-T-A-T-A, -T -T vitata. I've never heard of that particular species before, even amongst the different types of peppermints. Sourcing the right peppermint might also greatly affect your results. The egg thing is interesting to me because one of the problems with with like the with any of these types of pests is that the dips and, and things that you can do with your own elbow grease tend to be effective on everything but the eggs. So you're trying to like time the life cycle 
in such a way that like, okay, so we know that, that they're all going to hatch at this time, and then we're going to hit it with another dip. And then just in case another life cycle will happen, and we'll hit it again. And usually what happens is it, you know, one or two will survive some way, somehow. It just wasn't on the frag plugs at all, and they live. But apparently that there are, some of these shrimp do consume the eggs, which is interesting. And it's, it, they also found that the, the wrasses were actively hunting the flatworms, which I think we see when our six-line wrasses, like we see them like looking in all the crevices. So like they, they're actively hunting and they felt like the peppermint shrimp only ate the flatworms and the eggs when they happened across them. So like in their foraging behavior, mm -hmm. they happened across it, they ate it. Yeah, about that. So usually when I see peppermint shrimp in, in, in our tanks and everything, they hide all day because they're effectively like nocturnal shrimp. But if you ever go to see your tank at night, that shrimp is all over <laughs> the place. Like that thing is absolutely everywhere, crawling on everything, <laughs> crawling up the glass, like doing, it's, it's doing laps. So it is a much more active shrimp than, um, than you might expect just because you're usually not looking at your, your tank pitch black. Yeah, so like this is one of those things where like it seems like the idea if you can put in a wrasse that's going to eat all the flatworms and a peppermint shrimp who's also going to be eating the majority of the flatworms and over half the eggs, like eventually they would eat everything and you wouldn't have the flatworm problem anymore. But there's tons yeah. of tanks that have six line wrasses with peppermint shrimp that still have acro eating flatworms. So yeah. it's like one of those like practice and theory don't really necessarily yeah. match here. And, and sometimes it is a matter of patience. Because there, there, there's certain, um, and this is a, a total random anecdote, may not even apply at all, but there's certain predators for certain pests that just take their own sweet time. And it could take months, but eventually, like the predatory pressure. Like Bergia and Aptasia. Bergia and Aptasia is one. Another one would be just like the bumblebee snails mm -hmm. and vermitid snails. The Bergia thing, to totally like a as an aside, like sometimes like we struggle growing Bergia because copepods eat their eggs. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, you know what? Wouldn't it be nice if like copepods <laughs> and amphipods ate like Montipora eating nudibranch eggs, but they don't? Or at least not that I know of. Maybe but, this study just hasn't been done. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, so I interesting. You have, you have crustaceans that can, that can eat the eggs. Okay. The biggest issue I have with this study is that it's a very small tank with one frag, right? So you've got a captive audience for 24 hours where the only thing that these organisms are looking at is this Acropora frag. Yeah. Captive audience type stuff, right? Like Yeah, there's something to that because like, if you're feeding anything, if, you, if or if you just have a regular tank, there might be 10 other things that these fish and shrimp would rather be eating. That's a, that's a thing that we ran into with, with copper band butterflies. Most of them eventually, if they, if they ever get to eating, they will eat Aptasia. The problem is Aptasia is like ninth on their thing of their <laughs> list of things that they actually want to eat. And if you're not providing any of the first eight, they're just going to starve in the presence of like hundreds of Aptasia. Yeah, that was like one of my notes. Like I'd love to see this repeated where these organisms are actually being fed other things that we know they like, mm -hmm. and then how preferential are they on eating flatworms or their eggs? Like, do they touch them at all? Or they completely ignore them if there's other sources of food in the tank. Yeah, I'm happy that the study was done, certainly. Because mm -hmm. I think that there is something to be said about getting some data that something actually did something. Not, oh, I happened to put something in and something else disappeared. It's like, that. that's great and all, but that's not exactly that informative, but to say, okay, well, these things ate this, because there was nothing else for it to eat, was interesting. I mean, I think this graph says a lot too, that these bars don't overlap at all. There, this was a super significant study, like the, the P-value. Statistically value, significant study. Yes, the P-value is under 0 .001, and I'm sure if they had tested it, just looking at this visually, the statistical significance would be astronomical. Okay, so for the folks that didn't take college <laughs> level stats, what is a p-value? So the p-value is how likely this happened by random. 
And so the chance that this just so happened by random. They set this experiment up, all these flatworms and eggs disappeared randomly, had nothing to do with the fish, nothing to do with the shrimp, it's by sheer random chance. Less than like 0.001%, so okay. way less than a percentage 99 .99 something percent. That this happened because, because fish and shrimp ate the stuff. Which okay. is a big deal because you don't see those kind of levels in wild studies mm. very often. Like that's that's a really, really highly statistically significant number. Okay. So we talked about stuff that we would like to see. I would be curious to see other things other than the, than just this particular shrimp and this particular fish. Because of all the different wrasse species out there, six lines aren't high on my list. <laughs> I, I would much rather melanarises. I like timorasses. This is actually so. Brandy was the one who actually turned me on to timorasses. I'd never heard of the fish before. They're really pretty. They seem to be doing like some work. I love leopard rasses, but they ship so poorly. Uh, but they don't jump because I guess my by my criteria for rasses involves their propensity to jump also. So unfortunately, that means yellow chorus rasses are off the list. A whole bunch of other rasses are probably off the list because because of, of jumping behavior. So yeah, I stick to the ones that will stay in the tank with the most likelihood of picking at stuff. And six lines don't jump, clearly pick at stuff, but they can be a little hostile. And so at least they stay small, but they can be jerks. <laughs> As an aside aside, I think our friends at Polo Reef are trying to replicate these results. They said that they're, um, they've had some Good luck with it. So I'm assuming that they had actually, they've seen some of this behavior where some of the wrasses and peppermint shrimp potentially were actually eating eggs. Mm. I don't know if they're doing the counts like this paper did, but they're doing it in this in a bigger tank too, right? Mm. Like it's not one gallon in a 13 gallon tank, which means that some of the, the issues I had with just making this a more robust study is being met by the bigger tank and the more options for feeding those organisms have. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what they what they come up with and and their protocols and whatnot. But yeah, I think that going forward, it it would be incredibly nice to just to kind of have like a recipe of tank inhabitants where you get to a point that you know what, if there are acro eating flatworms coming in, I don't actually care because they're going to get absolutely sniped by my by tank inhabitants. And you know, I have you know, anecdotally, once again, met hobbyists that say more or less exactly that. And they have literally a dozen or so wrasses. They have X number of damsels and whatnot. And they're like, I've never had an issue with acro eating flatworms. And my tank is absolutely jam-packed with acros. And when you, when you have a tank that is jam-packed with acros, it is practically impossible to not eventually get the flatworms. Like they are so prevalent, they are they, they can come in on the most like microscopic pieces of whatever. Their eggs survive the apocalypse, and then suddenly <laughs> you, you have an outbreak, unless you have some kind of biological control that works. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that's that's something that I'm very highly desirous of. Any any last minute thoughts? I think that's all the things. It was a pretty short paper. Yeah. And and super impactful for me. Like I think that if I can again, if I if I can find the right mix, I would be a little less stressed out about acros. <laughs> All right, guys, that does it from here. I hope you learned something because uh, I I definitely did. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys next time. Happy reefing. Bye.